So I have two pieces for you. I read this on Sunday at Parkside. Working with Susan Sontag, not against. The first time I encountered Susan Sontag in New York City, it was not pretty, as opposed to South Orange or Cincinnati. Oh, it was not pretty then either, but I won't be catty. The first time I encountered Susan Sontag in New York City, I was a librarian at the MoMA, my home away from home in those days before the art world collapsed on itself. I cataloged cereals. I descended to the fifth floor on the way to lunch in the lunchroom at the lunch hour. Susan Sontag in all her skunk-haired glory was fuming and ranting. Where is everyone? I need to get into the photography department. And no one is around. It was the lunch hour. It was Wednesday when the museum was usually closed. I tried to explain this. It was the lunch hour. She was not amused as she fumed and pulled on the doorknob of the photography department door. The second time I encountered Susan Sontag in New York City, I was a librarian at the MoMA, my home away from home in those days before the art world collapsed on itself. I cataloged cereals. I descended to the lobby on the way home as the museum was closing. Susan Sontag in all her skunk-haired glory was in the revolving door with me. She pushing in the wrong direction, <laughs> ranting and fuming, fuming and ranting. What? This isn't how it is in France. I said nothing and left in the right direction, trying not to move against interpretation. <laughs> the third time I encountered Susan Sontag in New York City, I was a librarian at the MoMA. My home away from home in those days before the art world collapsed on itself. I cataloged cereals. I descended to the lobby on the way home as the museum was closing. I walked home on the quick hike down Avenue of the Americas and was about to step into the crosswalk at 46th Street, still quickly. I saw a pair of long, lean legs lunge in front of me, right to left. A mane of dark hair with a silver streak streaked by across my path. Susan Sontag in all her skunk-haired glory just cut me off. Me, the fastest walker in New York City, I said nothing, trying not to move against interpretation. <laughs> Thank you. The Large Ladies of Land's End and L.L. Bean. And the epigraph is the first line of Gertrude Stein's Lifting Belly. 1915 to 1917. I have been heavy and had much selecting. Because I am not satisfied by the limited palette of men's clothes, especially in turtlenecks, because I want a turtleneck in every shade without limitation and will wear them, because I want a turtleneck traditional or mock in every shade available, not just men's, because, traditionally, the palette for women's clothes is far more vast and specialized. Because I wear men's extra-large and triple extra-large in women's. Because Land's End and L.L. Bean are most accommodating and do not ask questions. Because Land's End and L.L. Bean do not ask questions but make assumptions. Because Land's End and L.L. Bean engage in marketing techniques to zero in by choices I receive mail order catalogs from Land's End and L.L. Bean and get promotionals online. I see the large women, tall of stature, thick of thigh, wide of waist, high of hip, in awkward poses meant to be casual and camera ready. They pose before the camera and the large ladies who shop, they look at me in their capris and scarves and long coats, car coats, blouses, and yes, turtlenecks. They smile at me at their sport. They smile at me at their sport and work and play. Hello? They smile at me at their work and sport and play. Displaying turtlenecks in every shade. Stone. Vermilion. Evening spruce. Autumn sunset. Brick Heather, Aubergine Plum, 
Rich Red, Russet, Elderberry, True Navy, Twilight Purple, Plum Tart, Ocean Tropic, Evening Blue, Teal Frost Heather, Eggshell, Sage, Soft Cherry, Camel. Because I am not satisfied, Because I am not satisfied, I give thanks to the large ladies of Land's End and L.L. Bean for being large, for living large, for buying large, <laughs> and letting me live large, or triple extra large, too. Thank you.